Modern deterrence theory developed as a result of nuclear weapons and mutually assured destruction. But is it still appropriate in the age of hackers, Twitter trolls and unattributed assassinations on foreign soil? Chapter 6. Updating deterrence. Is nuclear deterrence credible or relevant in a day when we have cyber attacks, when we have hybrid warfare, when we have non-state actors, as in it's not countries that are declaring war on us, but individual groups of people um, like Islamic State. What good does, in the UK sense, a submarine floating around somewhere armed with nuclear weapons, what's the purpose of that? Um, and I think this is where one has to play the long game. Uh, people have, have tendency to be very short-sighted and our submarine, the UK submarines, have been patrolling 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for now more than 50 years. And that's a pretty impressive capability. One doesn't know where the threat or the crisis is going to come and nuclear deterrence isn't something you can buy in a shop. You, this is a capability that takes time to acquire, time to train, time to perfect, and it's, it's a very, very, very good insurance policy. But that doesn't mean that you can't do other things as well. Would, for example, a nuclear deterrent be an effective um, counter to hybrid warfare? Is it still relevant today? Well, why hasn't there been a nuclear winter like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those serve as reminders that entire generations can be wiped out in the press of a button. And Chernobyl is still a radioactive graveyard 33 years later that breeds cancers to anyone who steps in its vicinity. And something like 20,000 years on, the radiation will dissipate by then 20,000 years on. So imagine the environmental catastrophe that is, as well as the generational damage that does. When one invents the wheel, one doesn't uninvent the wheel. It's, I think it is very difficult, once you're a nuclear power, to say, actually, you know, we are going to give up this capability right at the time that other countries are looking to acquire it. We have a shifting nature of alliances um, which again changes over history and because these are capabilities that have a very, very long lifespan, we don't know for sure what the situation is going to be in 50 years time and there may be new and different countries that have acquired this capability because there are an awful lot of countries trying to acquire nuclear capability and it, it seems somewhat foolhardy to say, well, we're just going to give ours away while we may not be able to disinvent nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence may not work in the case of emerging threats, such as hybrid warfare. How can the West deter aggression at the micro level of cyber attacks, poisonings and fake news? Yeah, the, the, the nature of, of, of warfare in the 21st century is that it's, it's happening now. I mean, how, how do you define war? I, I, in, in, in spring of this year, I was in Kiev talking to what turned out to be the outgoing presidential administration of, of Petro Poroshenko, and I was talking to a, one of his advisors, senior advisors, who was saying that in addition to, to shell fire across the border from, from Russian proxies in places like Donetsk and Luhansk, they were getting hundreds of cyber attacks against critical infrastructure, against the foreign ministry, against the election commission, and so on. And that's happening continuously all the time in the Baltic states. We get funding, including in this country, from people who are legally allowed to give money but are Russian emigres, uh, whose sources of, of original sources of funding is unclear. And, and so there's a kind of rolling program of, of, of measures that, that Russia is taking to undermine the West and to, to divide us uh, from each other. So, so it's, it's not you know, war than cessation, it, it's continuous. It's continuous. And so we need to be smart, we need to be thoughtful, um, and we need to be unified.
Deterrence is essentially about raising the cost of a possible hostile action. What would raise the cost of Russian aggression without resorting to nuclear war? Primarily, I would say sanctions against the people around Putin, the billionaires at the top of the state, many of whom have been sanctioned already, but lots of whom haven't, and visa bans, asset freezes, and so on. Because what you have to understand about, about 21st century Russia is it's an enormous kleptocracy. So you have nationalist propaganda, which is furious, but essentially the prime goal of these guys is to steal money and to offshore it. And because no one actually believes officially in the system, all of this loot is in the West. And so if you, if you keep that elite contained in some way, it may not stop bad behavior, but I think it shows there is a price to pay. Jamie Shea believes that the West's response has to be threefold, countering Putin's ideological attacks against Western liberal democracy, continuing to use traditional deterrence against a military threat from Russia, and boosting the resilience of our systems so that they can deter hybrid attacks. Russia has discovered that it's very easy to cause chaos and havoc uh, in Western societies uh, through staged deliberate attacks, uh, like in Salisbury, which it then subsequently denies, uh, through interfering uh, with elections, uh, through hacking into uh, uh, information networks and using the material to discredit one political party or another political party, uh, by funding political parties, by trying to create energy dependencies, by exploiting Russian gas and, and pipe lines by washing its dirty money uh, through many banks in NATO countries. And so NATO also has to be mindful that it can spot these kind of activities early on, attribute those activities reliably to uh, uh, Russia, uh, impose sanctions or take other measures that make this no longer a relatively high benefit, low risk exercise for Russia to impose penalties so that Russia uh, thinks twice before it does these kind of things and to overall improve the resilience of NATO's computer networks, you know, our energy grids, uh, our banking system and so on so that we're less vulnerable uh, to those kind of activities. Cyber security was an issue that perhaps came out of the view for many and many countries within NATO were slow to adapt and improve their cyber security which then became uh, which was then used as an advantage by many other other neighbouring forces. So my message would really be what measures are you employing to ensure that the generations like mine and mine to come are safe digitally? Cyber is an area where we have put in place a lot of cooperative programmes, particularly with the EU, which has similar concerns. But this is a national responsibility. Uh, countries themselves have to put in place measures which they feel are best for their populations. Some countries have put in place media literacy uh, courses within their schools to make sure that the younger generation are equipped to deal with the waves of disinformation that they have to deal with. What we want to do is A, make sure that people are aware of these dangers and the second thing is to put in place uh, as many projects, as many programs, as many cooperative schemes as possible to make sure that we share best practice. In other words, if a country is doing very well in this area, we need to learn from them. In terms of the cyber domain, we're very well aware of the potential risks. The NATO website is attacked multiple times a day. This is not a, an imaginary uh, threat. We see this up close and personal. But we're able to protect ourselves. We're, a, we're not a soft target. Yet, resilience which is about shielding yourself against an attack, is not the same as deterrence, which is about having a credible strategy of retaliation. Is deterrence even possible in the context of hybrid war, when attacks are anonymous and often confined to the level of individuals? Would NATO be prepared to activate Article 5 of its charter and apply the principle of collective defense in the case of a cyber attack? Hybrid threats are real. Cyber attacks, information attacks, energy cutoffs. And what we have said is, for example, in a cyber attack, it could trigger a collective defense response. But we have to see it, and then we'll know if it's the right level. So on the one hand, what we have to do is make sure that armed attack, traditional armed attack, is off the table by being strong. And that we're doing. And now we're beefing up our defenses against these hybrid attacks including beefing up our cyber defenses, countering disinformation, uh, working on energy security as well. 
So you're right that it's harder. My view is the most important thing we need is attribution. We need to be able to know who's behind it because that triggers all the rest of it. The whole point of hybrid is to be ambiguous. We need to cut through the ambiguity, identify who's behind it, and then we have the responses. Because when you look at many of these challenges like banks, energy grids, and news organizations, you know, the ownership of uh, social media and software programs, it's not the state any longer. 90% of this stuff today is owned and operated by the private sector. And they often know about a, a hybrid attack before governments do. So you have to build totally new partnerships that didn't exist in the Cold War. You also need to figure out when it comes to sanctions, what works? Uh, for example, I, uh, uh, let's say, uh, as the leader of a NATO country, could expel a number of Russian diplomats. But if President Putin thinks, fine, I don't mind, that's an easy price to pay, it's not going to stop me, then I may feel good about it, but it hasn't achieved its purpose of establishing deterrence. In other words, oh my God, I'm not going to do this again because uh, I have had to uh, uh, pay a price. So I think that there is a certain degree of trial and error when it comes to looking at what works. Uh, for example, you know, freezing the assets of oligarchs, <laughs> um, making it more difficult for Ru uh, Russian TV like RT uh, to spread fake news without being fined. Uh, for instance, imposing economic sanctions. You know, NATO calls this the playbook, and NATO can't do it alone. Uh, for example, uh, it's been uh, pursuing a closer partnership with the European Union, which in the financial, commercial, trade area has a lot more instruments than NATO has to impose those kind of sanctions against Russia. So uh, you, you have to have friends and partners in this effort uh, to make you, your own actions are more meaningful. Ian Bond agrees that a closer partnership between NATO and the European Union is required so as to effectively deter emerging security threats. NATO on its own is not equipped to deal with them and I think one of the challenges for the West, if I can use that construct, is to, to make sure that all of the organisations that we have are able to work together more effectively. Now there are some good examples of this. So you have a um, centre of excellence on hybrid warfare in Helsinki, which is effectively a joint EU-NATO operation, even though Finland is not a NATO member state. Um, and that's a, a good model. Cyber is another good example of that. NATO has certain competences in the cyber area, particularly on defending uh, your own military communications networks and so on. But if your civil infrastructure is not protected against cyber attacks, then, for example, your ability to move military forces around is going to be very limited, or you know, your headquarters buildings may be plunged into darkness by power cuts. And it's the EU which has a lot of the competences to, uh, to deal with those sorts of civilian cyber issues and setting standards for um, for companies to uh, have cyber defences in place and so on. War in the past used to have clear start and end points. It involved big armies fighting for territory. It was visible. As most of Europe has been free of conflict for 75 years, many people do not see the need to engage with issues of security and defence. The challenge for, for NATO today and for the, the people living today is that in Western Europe, the threat doesn't seem so obvious. And it's very hard to talk about how successful deterrence is, and nuclear deterrence in particular, um, when, when there doesn't appear on the surface to be any immediate need for it. Um, we're sitting here in London. There's no sense in London that we're a country at war. There's no sense... Um, that our lifestyle is under threat, under a really credible threat. Um, there's no sense of total war where the entire fabric of society could be overturned. Go a thousand miles further east and you get a slightly different sense because it's only 30 years since country, since people living, again, we'll talk about the Baltic states, were not allowed to speak their own language, were not allowed to fly their flag, were not allowed to practice their religion, were not allowed any of the human, basic human rights that we take for granted. Um, and I think you get a different uh, perspective of the importance of, 
of keeping the peace there than maybe you do here. I notice a really interesting difference between um, Bulgaria and the UK in terms of awareness of NATO. Um, that was at the time when I was doing my NATO project. So I talked to my friends back home, I talked to my friends here in the UK. And what I noticed is that my friends back home knew more about NATO, but they didn't know much, they didn't, they didn't know enough. They only knew, for example, what the abbreviation stands for and just generally what they do. And when I talked to people back here in the UK, they, their, reac their, their reactions were like, what's NATO? So to some degree, NATO has to sort of re-educate the public that the reality of old-style warfare is still there, absolutely, particularly when you see what countries like Russia are spending on modernising their military forces and nuclear weapons. But on the other hand, NATO has to move towards public opinion in a reverse direction by being mindful of the fact that to remain relevant, it's also got to look at some of these so-called new security challenges that come from issues like disinformation campaigns, interference in elections, people using chemical weapons in English cathedral cities like Salisbury, uh, you know, the whole issue of cyber security. When people can't see things, it's more difficult for them to understand. But as soon as someone can't get their internet connection or their GPS, you know, on their phones break down, then they start to sort of perhaps make a connection. So maybe we need to be... Uh, better at putting um, things in a more uh, modern context of what the impact of a cyber attack would be or what the impact of uh, some kind of activity in space that will take out your the GPS systems and that and, and what that would mean for people and that would be you know a massive um, attack on people's everyday lives. In 21st century hybrid warfare, the target is not planting a flag, but winning the hearts and minds of the public. In a way, we are all taking part in this battle, usually without even being aware of it. The battlefield of the 21st century is not the trenches, the fields and the bridges of rural Europe, but our laptops and smartphones, our minds. Winning this war requires mass engagement and perhaps the toughest challenge facing NATO today is that of mobilising Europe's public. There is a, a, a sort of a complacency that we need to guard against. We have to remind people constantly as to the why we need to do things. I definitely think they, uh, these sort of threats affect our everyday life um, because you just have to look at what's happened in the past with Russia um, and, you know, Salisbury is right around the corner. Um, they're definitely still there and still threats are active. I think about stuff like that a lot, all the time. And I think it does, it does affect people personally. The threats may be less obvious. They may be at a, at a lower level in terms of, you know, they're obviously very serious for individuals who are caught up in it. But by comparison with the threat of all out nuclear war, they're not on such a large scale. Uh, and in some ways that makes it harder for organisations like NATO to, to deal with. You know, sitting in London, the focus is on elections, the focus is on Brexit, the focus is on Christmas presents. It's not on how are we actually going to survive? Will we be allowed to speak our language? Will we be allowed to pray to our own faith or indeed any faith? Will we be able to live our lives and not be turned in by our next door neighbour um, to the authorities? Will we be sent to prison camps for no obvious reason? We, we do take things very much for granted here and we take NATO for granted. But then, during our interview with Alexandra Ashbourne Wormsley, reports arrive of an incident a mile away from the studio at London Bridge. Yeah, I actually wanted to, um, excuse my goodness, but um, there's actually been an incident right now on London Bridge. It's quite unusual to see an armed policeman. Do you know any more details about uh, it? I think the incident that has just happened um, on London Bridge will make people 
inquire where have the guns come from, who is supplying these people, who has radicalized somebody to the extent that they are prepared to have kill themselves, um, or at least put themselves at risk of being killed. Um, that That's a change. But again, it doesn't change the whole of society. It won't even, again, even to, tonight, because there's been an atrocity, there will be something about this on the news and people will express their horror, but it will not be a life-changing incident for the 60 million people in the United Kingdom. The issue of terrorism poses a challenge for NATO, as it has not been traditionally part of its agenda, and despite the human cost and impact on communities, is not always recognized by policymakers as an existential threat, but as a localized one. However, even before the latest London Bridge attack, terrorism was the number one security threat for our students. The main security threat for me as a UK citizen is, is, is the threat of terrorism coming from homegrown issues. A lot of these terrorist attacks, there was the one in Manchester, uh, the West Westminster Bridge, these were British-born people who were killing other British people, and that's quite a terrifying thought. Obviously, terrorism, Actually, and I think about this a lot, especially um, something that I know that the UK have to tackle a lot is terrorism on transport. I mean, I know quite a lot of people that are scared to go into London, go to big cities, travel on trains, go travel by aeroplane because of it. And I mean, I think in a way, not knowing is quite terrifying. The prospect that a weapon of mass destruction, such as a dirty bomb, might be used as part of a terrorist attack means that NATO has to engage with the issue. Again, as with climate security and political values, people are challenging the silos in which NATO has traditionally operated. What is NATO's role in preventing terrorism now? Is it because terrorism is used in social media that we need to consider cybersecurity hand in hand with terrorism? I do think that preventing terrorism should be NATO's role. It is NATO's role because it all, it all boiled down, it all comes to security. I can't think of any other organisation that we can look up to when it comes to terrorism because NATO is, supposed, is it's supposed to, to defend us, isn't it? You know, we're speaking uh, just a few days after a, a terrorist attack on London Bridge now. What's that got to do with NATO? Well, the only thing it's got to do with NATO is that in the end, you know, whether we're talking about uh, stability in the Middle East, whether we're talking about uh, the, the attempts to control and defeat jihadism in all of its forms, whether it be in northern Syria, whether it be sometimes in our own countries, these things have a collective security element to them. Now, NATO is for us in Western Europe, the most important platform for collective security, nations cooperating together to defend, you know, and, and this is what they say, and it's, it's in many ways it's true, defend freedom and democracy and our values. So if, if NATO going forward isn't going to be what it was in the past, we need to think very carefully about what is going to be our collective effort to make the world as safe as it can be for democracy, for freedom, for our sorts of values. And it's big picture stuff, but it does in the end come back to all of us feeling secure and safe in our lives, in democracies that have taken so many years to build and to protect. Uh, that's why I think all of us should care about the future of alliances like NATO. Terrorism. Cyber attacks. Hybrid warfare. Nuclear proliferation. Russia, China, global instability, internal strife, a distracted, skeptical public. Will NATO survive in the 21st century? Can it protect us still?